Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Road 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and tonight I am very excited to talk to you guys about one Vladimir Kramnik and how for a couple decades there, he seemed to win every game with the white pieces in the Catalan. Uh, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but of course, Kramnik is uh, well known for changing the face of modern openings in modern day chess at the top level. He revived the Catalan, he brought you the Berlin, and uh, he's known for much, much more. Uh, of course, that's his biggest legacy on uh, openings these days. The Berlin and the Catalan don't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. So why do I want to talk to you about specifically Vladimir Kramnik's Catalan today? Why not just the Catalan in general? And part of the reason why I want to focus on Kramnik in particular where, uh, is, number one, he was so good at it, and number two, it could be a great way to get a feel for an opening to pick you know, sort of a specialist in that opening and go through their games, see how they are adapting their repertoire uh, against each of the main lines against your opening. So we're going to see how Kramnik wants to respond to the main defenses against the Catalan and see if we can find some consistency there. Because a great player's repertoire tends to be kind of consistent. They're going for similar ideas in different positions, and that makes it a lot easier to play, a lot easier to keep track of. And I think Kramnik does a good job of it here in the Catalan. So to start off with, I want to take a look at this game between Kramnik and Alexander Morozovic. Um, Kramnik starts with the ready move order with one knight f3, but we get back to the normal Catalan stuff soon enough. We get c4, e6, g3, d5, and d4. Uh, of course, just transposing to a mainline Catalan. So Kramnik, of course, uh, hints that he's going to play the Catalan with this move g3, preparing to being cut of the bishop. And then it is just a Catalan and not an English once uh, the pawn lands on the d4 square. So like I said, we're going to take a look at a lot of the main defenses to the Catalan. But in this game, we're going to see what happens if uh, black calls white a dummy because this pawn on c4 is attacked and in fact not defended because white is developing the bishop out to the uh, g2 square. This bishop is not going to be recapturing on c4 as it would in a typical queen's gambit. That's sort of the, the whole point here. We're bringing the bishop to the long diagonal, not the c4 square. So in this case, Morozovic is going to take on c4 and try to hold on to this pawn and find compensation that way for the super powerful uh, bishop. Kramnik, of course, is just going to continue out now with bishop to g2. You can also play the quieter move, queen a4 check, if you're really worried about getting this pawn back. But bishop g2 is the normal. Uh, a6 now by Morozovic is preparing to defend this guy. We get knight e5. A bishop b4 check to develop with tempo. Knight c3. And now knight d5. So what black has done in this opening is taken on c4 very early on and is now trying to use some active play against white's king before white is comfortably castled to sort of stunt this bishop on g2 and hold on to this pawn on c4. So as Kramnik here, what do you think we should do? Can we get away with castling our king in this position? Can we get away with it? Four allows e5. So yeah, on those first few moves, uh, Kramnik uh, obviously swapped between a lot of different move orders for the first three moves. He was comfortable playing the ready with one knight f3 and comfortable allowing the ensuing positions. So uh, if you don't want to get tricked into random ready positions, you can start with one d4 and play the Catalan like that. Um, it's just a matter of which lines you're looking to avoid on the day. Great Wolf thought Kramnik was known for being tall. It turns out Kramnik was known for at least two things then. At least two. <clears throat> a little bit later in the lecture, we'll learn that he was also known for going to the bathroom a lot in his world championship matches. But that's beside the point. That's beside the point. <clears throat> so of course, in this position, uh, as we're still getting rolling here, uh, we have kingside castles by white. You know, you don't really 
have to worry so, so much about this pawn on c3. It turns out that black can, in fact, capture it. But it's perfectly in line with our game plan to bring this rook to b1, when all of a sudden you see that the, the activity on the light squares is already beginning to sort of come to a head here. This b7 pawn is going to fall. White's going to have a ton of compensation. And black is not really even going to be able to hold on to the extra material. Uh, play could continue with something like queen takes d4, queen a4 check, b5, queen a3, and things just get wild from here on out. The rook is attacked, the, queen on, the knight on e5 is attacked. We have an in-between move, bishop f4, bishop c7. And this is one of those lines where you kind of have to know everything, and then maybe black's OK. So definitely not what uh, Morozovic was looking for in, in this game. Just want to highlight that this stuff does exist, and you should take a look at it if you are thinking of playing like this with kingside castles. In the game, though, Morozovic picks the more normal move, kingside castles for black. This knight c3 line, honestly, probably isn't that great for, for black from what I've seen of it. And uh, castles should be a little bit better, in, in my opinion. OK, now in the game, we do have castles, and the knight on c3 is still attacked. So white plays queen c2 just to defend the knight. Now black plays b5. And we have to find some way to mount an attack on the light squares. That's going to be the common thread. That's going to be the consistent thing throughout all the games we look at today. Kramnik finds some way, no matter what black does, to mount an attack on the light squares. And I think that's the most instructive thing you can take away from his treatment of the Catalan. So as white, how do we break through on the light squares? We need to come up with some kind of plan here. Ah, and Great Wolf is unaware of the infamous, infamous toilet gate, as it was so named, from 2007. 2006, not 2007. Great Wolf says a4. And yeah, you're definitely on the right track here, Great Wolf. Um, you you want to be able to break down Black's structure somehow. But if you play a4 directly, I don't think it's going to be uh, going to be quite enough here. We'll take a look at that in, in a moment. Biggie Biggie says a4 or e4. So something to note is that this bishop only attacks dark squares, and this knight is applying pressure to the light squares. So it's not always in white's best interest to allow this move bishop takes c3. It doesn't seem like something you should really all be all that concerned about. But uh, if black does get to play bishop takes c3 in some positions, then uh, your pressure on the light squares is going to be a little bit harder to maintain. For example, if you just play some slow move like bishop d2, black very well may take on c3, play f6 to eject our knight. And then all of a sudden, we're attacking none of black's light squares. Uh, so Kramnik took a look at this in the game, and he realized that now was actually the correct time to capture on d5, which might not be a move that strikes out to most people at first, uh, at first glance. Of course, black is going to take back on d5. And now it looks as though our light squared attack is sort of uh, falling behind here. You know, white is, black is making quite the wall with all of the pawns on light squares, and it's going to be tough to break through. Uh, we'll see what happened there in a moment, but let's take a look at this move a4 first. I think with a4, again, it's going to be a similar thing where black is able to take on c3, perhaps, eject our knight, and again, continue out with bishop b7. And again, we just are not really mounting that much pressure without this knight on c3. So that's why Kramnik plays the unexpected knight takes d5. Uh, it's a really important move when you sort of understand the consistency in this light squared pressure that Kramnik is going for. You know, it might not be a move that you consider at first, but uh, it's perfectly in line with Kramnik's plan. And you'll notice that every move Kramnik plays from here on out is an assault on black's light squared pawns and light squares in general. So e takes d5. Now, how do we continue the assault on the pawns? How do we continue here? Q 
keep in mind this one annoying move I kept playing. Uh, we're going to have to get, get pretty creative in order to, uh, to get around this one move, sort of stopping our play. So e4 is being suggested. And yeah, e4 again, the problem is going to be this annoying move that I keep bringing up. This move f6 is surprisingly a very, very important defensive resource for black here. The second f6 gets played, if we can't do something special, we're just going to have to retreat our knight. And then after a simple move like bishop b7, you know what, what are we doing with this pawn? Our, our pawn is attacked, so we're going to go e5. Are we going to take and uh, activate our opponent's pieces? Our, our light squared assault is not going so well. So Kramnik finds some way to very creatively make, uh, make this f6 move not so much of a problem. Yeah, I know, but, but Ben Feingold says, Ben Feingold says. NJF says a4 again, a4, f6. We need something better. a3 is a tempo, so I don't think a3 is going to be the most helpful to us. It doesn't really spoil too much, but our opponent's bishop might actually be happier back here on a5, where it can drop back to this diagonal, apply a little bit of pressure to our d pawn. Um, so yeah, it, I, it doesn't really gain a tempo or lose a tempo. You spend a move on a3, opponent spends a move on, on bishop a5, and the rest sort of sits. So Malol has the correct move b3, but what is the idea if black were to play f6 here? This is important. What is the point? Because if you just play knight f3 here, you have all the same problems as before. Black can play any number of moves and be perfectly happy with uh, his position. So what was the point? Why was b3 so necessary? Malol says go. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. What's our point here? Uh, Burrito says, couldn't the pawn on b2 go to b4 and trap, or get the bishop, take the bishop? Um, I think you're talking about in that a3 line. The bishop would go back here to b6 in response to b4, just apply a little bit more pressure. Can we play b take c4? That's exactly. Correct. B takes c4 is the very important idea. And if black had played f6, this would simply be a winning idea here. If you capture the knight, and then take on d5 with check, and take your rook. And you can try something like c6, but you're not really going to keep my, my bishop trapped for too long here. My queen is going to help out. And black is busted. So b, c, 4, the really important idea. This is why Kramnik is playing b3 here. Playing very, very actively, because black has tried to hold on to this extra pawn. Uh, when black tries to play against the Catalan, uh, like it's a gambit like this, to hold on to the pawn, you do have to come up with some ver very active ideas. But again, the central theme is always going to be attacking on the light squares. So Morozovic comes up with the best move here in the form of pawn to c6, just simply solidifying, building the pawn diamond of power. And again, we need to break through. What can we do here? Ben Feingold was right after all, it turns out. Uh, it's just that white has to know what he's doing uh, in order to punish f6 properly. See, Morozovic is no slouch. He's not playing f6. He's not going to lose the game like that. Yeah, Rosatote says, now e4. And again, this is the move that Kramnik plays in the game. However, things are a little bit different after f6 now. We've played this move e4. Our opponent has defended this pawn a little bit better. And our bishop doesn't quite have such easy access to the d5 square. So what's the deal? Morozovic actually does play f6 now, and we need an idea here. What's our point? Con uh, Connor McCormick says still b takes c4, and he is almost correct. Um, maybe b takes c4 is just as good, but it, there might actually be an important difference. Yeah, so ag says, 
e takes d5, or silver, I guess. I don't know. Maybe ag. <laughs> um, and e takes d5 is what, what is played in the game. And now you might be thinking, hold on a second, your knight's attacked, and you're actually just totally right. This is a peace sacrifice by Vladimir Kramnik. And again, it just goes to show his commitment to the plan here. We are assaulting the light squares no matter the cost. So e takes d5, and then following that up with b takes c4. We don't care about this pawn. We want to rip open the light squares, get after this rook, and activate our Catalan bishop. Uh, now why not b takes c4 immediately here? Um, I think perhaps black could consider actually taking back on c4 and giving you maybe potentially some more problems after all. Your d-pawn is hanging. Um, there are other ideas associated with that as well. And you do have to do something with this knight. So ed5 instead. Now c, uh, b takes c4. Black takes as many pawns as possible with e takes d4. And now we get d takes c6. White also coming crashing through now. By the way, we do have a threat. Our threat is c7, uh, attacking the rook, attacking the queen, attacking the knight. Can't defend them all. Uh, and black comes up with this nice move, uh, bishop e6 here. So what's the point of bishop e6? What do you guys think we should play with the white pieces here? Great Wolf says, how do you judge if this piece sack is sound or not? I'm not going to lie to you. I think Kramnik had this one uh, prepared prior, prior to this game. This one would be a pretty tough one to just sort of intuitively come up with on, on the spot. That being said, it just comes down to calculation, right? Um, you should be able to calculate f6, take, 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 take. You should be able to get here pretty easily on your own. Um, and then thinking in your head, you know, obviously everybody's at different levels. But as far as calculating long lines go, this one was pretty forcing. And then after this, you might realize that d takes c is really your only idea. And then if you are thinking here you can't find a good move for black and you think you, you're going to be able to win some material back, then that's a moment when I would say you can consider actually going for the peace sacrifice. Obviously, that's going to be difficult in a real game if you don't feel very well prepared. But um, that's the best advice I can offer on judging sacrifices. Calculate, calculate, calculate. And then if you get to the end and you feel good about your position, might as well give it a go. Uh, so Nick fell for my trap. I told you c7 was the answer, and then it's actually not the answer here. So why not c7? Well, black has taken quite a lot of material at this point. And after queen takes c7, if we do play bishop takes a8, uh, the simple move is queen takes c4. If we go for a trade, all of a sudden, this rook is trapped, uh, and black is, is simply better. If we go rook d1, the only square, we can go bishop e2, and bishop c3. Actually, apparently bishop e2 is wrong. We can go bishop c3 first, and then bishop e2. And that's the better move order. Nowhere to go for this rook. All stuck alone on the first rank. So pretty wild stuff, pretty wild stuff to see coming. But Kramnik saw it in advance, and he said, you know what? I'm going to stay down the piece, and I'm going to just play my position. So he comes up with the incredible move. C takes b5. And notably, white's last four moves were taking all of these pawns. So just incredible assault on these light squares here. Um, Morozovich comes up with this move d3, and unfortunately, this is uh, the quote unquote losing move. You know, it's not entirely lost yet, but uh, Morozovich's position is going to be pretty tough to, to save after this one. What should he have done instead? Honestly, it's already pretty tough. The best move in the position, I think, is rook a7. Um, and the idea is pretty simple it's that c7 was a threat and you have to stop it somehow. But looking at this knight on b8, it's, it's already going to be a difficult uphill battle for, um, for black here. For example, rook b1 is threatening to push b6. And then we can activate our pieces, activate our pieces. And this rook, honestly, maybe shouldn't even be saved. Um, sad stuff. I guess bishop b6 is probably the, the move here. But uh, it's already a difficult position for black, to be sure. Instead, though, we get the more forcing move, d3. Now, what's wrong with d3? 
White to move here. White to move. What can we do? And yeah, now c7 is, in fact, the correct idea. Uh, why is it better now? Well, queen takes c7 has been stopped thanks to our last move. c takes b5. Our queen is now active on the c file. It's going to be another common theme we see in Kramnik's games here. Uh, this queen on the c file is a very, very important piece, uh, a very important attacking piece on the c file. Um, now, of course, if you were to capture my queen, I would simply capture your queen, capture your rook, and now bishop c4 isn't going to be quite as scary as before. We simply develop, give you back uh, this rook if you want it, and attack your rook in exchange. If you save your rook, feeling I don't really even know here, I'll just play rook c1, and it's too difficult for you to, uh, to keep everything together here. And as for the material count, I'm already up in exchange. And one pawn for now, probably I'm going to be up one pawn at the end of the day. And so if I have to give back the exchange, I certainly can. And uh, white's going to be just winning. So what was the point? The point is that d takes c2, not a good move. What Morozovich came up with is queen d4. But now, unfortunately, Kramnik seals the deal here, sacrificing this rook on a1 with this move queen a4. Again, all these moves occurring on the light squares, or with the theme of attacking the light squares, opening up the light squares. Queen a4, now knight d7. If you thought about taking this rook on a1, you thought wrong. We can take on a8, but even better is capturing on b4, leaving this rook just hanging. And uh, obviously, your rook a7 isn't really doing much for you either. Also, rook a7. I think I can take this and take this. Very good. Um, so queen a4, and you can't take the rook on a1. The knight on b8 is still hanging. So we get knight d7, trying to defend this rook on a8 as well. But at this point, things are getting very, very sad for black very, very quickly. Bishop b3 develops with tempo. Queen d6. We take the rook now. Bishop uh, f4 defends the pawn and attacks the queen. Um, queen back to f8. Now b6. And this is sort of the end of the game here. Uh, you cannot play knight takes b6, because queen c6 uh, attacks three things at the same time. I guess the, the, the rook on a8 isn't quite as important, but uh, very good move. So knight e5 was played, but now these two pawns are going to be enough to win. Uh, Morozovic goes for some sort of checkmate idea on the light squares, but it's obviously not going to be enough. f3 puts a stop to the checkmating idea, and Morozovich resigns here. So very, very impressive game by Vladimir Kramnik. Now, you know the, the point I want you to take away from this game isn't this crazy piece sacrifice. It makes the game more interesting when there's a fun piece sacrifice, and uh, you know Kramnik uh, continues sacrificing, continues playing actively in order to win. The point I want you to take away, though, is this assault on the light squares, this almost tunnel vision on opening up the light squares, activating your Catalan bishop, and playing for the advantage in that way. Because if you pay attention, all the games we look at tonight are going to share this theme of just an assault on the light squares, no matter what black is doing. And that's what the Catalan is all about. So let's continue on now. I want to take a look at another game. This time, it's going to be Kramnik versus Peter Fiddler. We're going all the way back to the 90s for this one, 1998. Uh, both of these players, uh, a lot younger back then, a lot fresher. And the Catalan, a lot newer of an idea at the top level. Of course, it saw some use. Um, I think Kasparov played it a couple times back in the 80s, but it didn't really stick around at the top level too, too much. And Kramnik is the guy who uh, brought it back. So let's take a look here. We have Kramnik with white pieces playing knight f3. We get knight f6. And again, transposing to our Catalan with d4 on move 4. Now bishop b7, bishop g2, castles, castles, and d takes c4. So d takes c4 in this game a lot like Morozovich's game, but notably black was a little bit more responsible with the king in this case, 
playing bishop e7 and castling before taking on c4. White also has completed castling and is now going to try to pick up the pawn uh, with queen c2. So it's not too late for black to go a little bit crazy with b5, try and hold on to some material. But those lines get very, very complex. Much, much more common in this case is the move a6, which is what uh, Svidler played in the game. Now, what's the point here? Well, uh, the point is that black did, yes, take on c4. But rather than try to hold on to the pawn, black is going to try to use the uh, extra tempi uh, that white spends recapturing it in order to finish activating his pieces and counteract white's powerful, powerful, powerful light squared bishop. So this is, you know, while we do see d take c4 in this game as well, it's a pretty different plan than what we saw in game one. Morozovic wanted to keep the pawn, wanted to build a wall and have extra material. Peter Svidler in this case, playing a little bit more with the tempi, trying to finish development, trying to counteract white's bishop. Now in the game, we see the move queen takes c4. These days, people are leaning more towards this move a4 in order to stop the line we see in the game with b5. Um, a4. And the idea, of course, is just to put a little bit more pressure on black's position and uh, keep black from, from playing b5 quite so easily. Obviously, the downside is that you have to spend a tempo playing the move a4. Uh, in the game, though, just queen takes c4, b5, queen back to c2, and bishop b7. Uh, so seemingly, Svidler has done everything he needs to do. He put the bishop opposite this bishop. No way the light squares are going to come under fire anymore. You know, black certainly must be out of the woods because the bishop made it to the diagonal. Of course, that's not going to be not going to be the case here. So there's a second idea I mentioned in the previous game that's going to show up a lot, and that idea is the C file, and that is what uh, Kramnik takes advantage of here to keep the pressure up, and eventually use the C file to apply even more pressure on this light square diagonal. So with all that in mind, white to move here, what do you think Kramnik's most testing option is? There's obviously a few moves here. They're all perfectly fine. But I do think Kramnik's option is perhaps one of the more testing ideas. One of the more testing ideas. So Nick says bishop d2 to a5, and Oisev says bishop f4, as does Arco. So everybody has the idea of attacking the pawn on c7. I'm not so sure I see the argument for bringing the bishop out this way. You might be concerned about what Svidler played in the game, but we'll see that that idea is perhaps not so strong. So I like bishop f4. It does it in one move, while this would take, obviously, two moves. Now, you might have been concerned about this move knight d5, which is actually what was played in the game, because this attacks your bishop on f4, and a lot of players might not be so reluctant to give up this bishop. Now, of course, we are Catalan players. The dark squared bishop is nothing to us. All we care about is this light squared bishop. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but we'll see in this game that uh, Kramnik does just fine while also allowing Swidler the opportunity to take here on f4. Now this knight d5 idea, I'm actually not the biggest fan of it by uh, Svidler in this game. I think the uh, main move, which is knight c6, is going to give black a lot better opportunities to equalize. And honestly, in these lines where white doesn't play a4, I don't think black has too much trouble getting an equal game with this idea of knight c6. What's the point? Well, the point is we have dealt with the pressure to our c7 pawn. By the way, that was the point of bishop f4, making use of the queen. Uh, we've dealt with the pressure by interfering with the queen's access to this pawn. We're also applying a little bit of pressure to the center ourselves. And after a simple move like rook to c1, we actually have a nice tactical idea of playing this move knight to b4. Uh, what's the point of knight b4? Well, we're rerouting our knight to d5 with a perfectly strong blockade. And you can't quite get away with taking on c7, because I will take, take, and trap your rook here on a1. So this move knight c6, honestly, I think leaves white with a little bit, a, a few too many problems to consolidate into an advantage. But uh, Svidler instead, going for knight d5, a more direct approach, sticking this knight on the light squares, going after the bishop, and uh, keeping the game flowing. Now, how do we continue? Well, we see knight c3 by Kramnik. This move shouldn't really surprise you. 
Uh, again, this is the, the best square in this line for the knight, as we are just applying very, very, very direct pressure to this knight on d5. Now, I will say sometimes you'll see this knight go knight bd2 and knight b3. Uh, and the idea there is to keep this pawn backwards on c7. But in this case, we're sticking with the light squared assault. Uh, attacking this knight on d5, Svidler moves the knight, captures on f4, we get g takes f4. I also want to point out this structure, uh, while it does have some weaknesses in it, is actually not really one you need to be super worried about. Um, it gives you very, very excellent control over the e5 square, very excellent central control. And it doesn't actually weaken your king too, too much, especially with this bishop on g2 still being alive. So while you, know, you should, in general, avoid double pawns, in this case, these are some pretty useful double pawns. It gives you a lot of mobility as well. Uh, controlling the e5 square while also you know, toying with a few different pawn breaks in the position. Uh, black now continues with knight d7. The idea now being to go uh, out to b6 and try to set up a blockade on d5. Or f6 is perhaps a little bit more natural than b6. Same idea though. Uh, what are we going to do now? Uh, with the white pieces, you know, we've uh, given up our dark squared bishop in exchange for a knight. We need to find some way to keep putting on the pressure uh, to the light squares, but uh, we don't want to be too, too hasty here. So what are some ideas? Like Karpov's Immortal. Yeah, of course, Karpov perhaps has the most famous light squared assault with, uh, I can never remember the real name of it, it's something like White Keys Symphony, Symphony on the White Keys or something. They, they tried to bring like music into it, but uh, Karpov, of course, has a very famous game against Kasparov, where he plays you know, 15-some moves all on the light squares. And that's the common theme here in these games as well. Mm. Knight e4, not my favorite move of all time, to be honest. Um, Black actually has a pretty interesting idea that you might not be familiar with if you haven't seen it before. But uh, keeping in mind the light squared assault, it might make a little bit more sense. So knight e4, Black actually has a couple moves that he can play here. Rook c8, for example, is simple enough and continues preparing the c5 push. But f5 is actually a very, very reasonable and very decent move here for Black. By committing this bishop to the long diagonal, it's going to be pretty difficult for White to actually apply meaningful pressure to this pawn on... Uh, on e6. And if we do continue just by retreating the knight, either to g3 or c3, I'm just going to play c5. I'm going to break in the center. And it's going to be black uh, taking over on some of these light squares now. So knight e4, interesting idea. Not going to do it for me, though. I just want to stick with this move for f to d1. Now, how is this move of increasing our pressure to the light squares? Well, we'll see in a little bit how this rook can, in fact, be very, very useful. Uh, of course, though, we can immediately see white is hinting at ideas of d5, attacking the light squares with the pawn and opening the d file. Now, in the game, Swither plays a move that is, quite frankly, just unconscionable. Uh, I can't recommend this uh, playing like this with black to anybody. And frankly, you know, I recommend that children hide their eyes from the next move. It, it hurts to see. I have no idea why he did it. Um, well, actually, it's a lie. I have some idea. But he plays bishop takes f3. And bishop takes f3 is just the, the Catalan player's dream. Now your, your, your super powerful bishop is quite simply unopposed, and the light squares are eventually going to fall. So why does Fiddler do it? Why, oh, why does he play bishop takes f3? Well, I think what he was concerned about is if you play the more normal looking move, knight f6, with the idea being you just want to set up this blockade. I think Svidler was very concerned about not seeing the bishop land somewhere on the diagonal, but instead uh, having to deal with this knight jumping into c6 sort of at any moment. But we'll see in the game, the knight on c6 alone, not actually that scary. Not going to be super terrifying staring down this knight on c6 uh, alone. Now, why is that? Well, we could play a move like knight queen d7. You can even play queen e8. And what's this knight doing here? It's not really able to create any threats on its own. It, you know, we could even try something like knight e4, uh, but we're playing a bit too loose now, and I think we're actually losing some material. 
So I think this is why Svidler chose to take on f3. This knight landing on e5 just looked too, too ugly uh, with this knight c6 idea always sort of looming in the position. And I don't think he was very happy with that. Now, the answer cannot be bishop takes f3, because we'll see that Kramnik has a very, very clever idea to uh, not only increase the pressure, but just sort of blow Svidler out of the water in this game. So of course, we take back with the bishop. And now we get rook b8. Of course, this rook is now under attack, since the light square bishop is missing from black's camp. Uh, now, uh, Kramnik plays a very solidifying move that is very, very common for this structure. Just e3, making sure that black doesn't have any funny tactics, any funny threats against f4. Now, play continues with knight f6. So they very calmly, or sorry, Kramnik very calmly plays rook a to c1, increasing the pressure to c7. Again, the c file, a very, very important idea here for white as well. Queen d6 played in the game. And now I want you to find Kramnik's uh, amazing reroute and uh, you know semi-long-term plan. It only takes him a few moves to pull off this plan, but uh, Black is quite frankly helpless to to stop it. So see if you can come up with the plan that Kramnik enacted here to just demolish Swidler on the light squares. All right, a4 has been suggested. a4 isn't quite right here. Um, we're more concerned with this diagonal and using and abusing the squares on this diagonal. You know, attacking a4 honestly might even help, uh, attacking with a4 might help black more than white here, opening up the b file. So if we combine everybody's in, everybody in the chat seems to have a different idea. Um, and I think together, they all make one really great idea in the form of Kramnik's plan. So this move 92, I think, is really, really excellent. And this is what uh, Kramnik plays in the game. Tactically, by the way, knight to, F, knight to e4 is, in fact, going to be a very good option. Black is going to have to take this knight um, if you move the queen back out of the way. And then, of course, queen c7. This is just hanging. So you have to take this guy, and then you have to play this move f5 in order to not lose a pawn in rook fc8. And this move, I mean, this position is still very, very, very uncomfortable for black. This bishop is simply no match for the light squared bishop on f3. However, Svidler, or I'm sorry, Kramnik chose this move 92, and I like this better. It keeps the knights on the board, and Kramnik's next few moves are, are very, very convincing. Uh, Svidler plays this move rook f to c8. And now e4. Uh, that's the idea of the knight on e2, defending these loose squares, and then getting ready to push through with e4. Uh, Svidler now has to, so I'm sorry, I should mention knight e2, by the way, attacks c7 as well, which is why you see this move, rook fc8 by uh, Svidler. You, you have to defend the pawn. Now e4 makes another threat. Everything is coming with tempo. Queen d7, stepping out of the fork. And now d5. And this is just uh, just terrifying stuff at this point. You know, Svidler, all those moves ago, played bishop takes f3 to stop a knight from landing on e5 and uh, later c6. And now, after e takes d5, of course, what is Kramnik's idea? What is Kramnik's idea? Just laughing in Svidler's face after he went to such great lengths to uh, make sure a knight didn't land on c6. And yet, yeah, Oisev has the right idea once again. Uh, just the wrong notation. I think Oisev is trying to say e5. And this is the perfect move. Of course, we do not want to play e takes d5, leaving these pawns doubled and isolated and giving our opponent a great opportunity to actually shut our bishop out of the game once again. We want to play e5, keeping the diagonal as open as possible, forcing this knight back to e8. Now we take on d5 with the diagonal still open. Queen h3, bishop g2 is the tempo, queen h4, and now simply knight d4. This knight's landing on c6, and this time it's not on its own. It's got this bishop backing it up. The rooks are going to be entirely trapped on their own back rank. Uh, Kramnik also has taken over the d file, as well as the half-open c file, 
and black's pieces are just miserable here. Uh, black does have one thing going for him, and that is that the F pawn is hanging. Sviddler captures that pawn and says, uh, you know, I've taken your pawn. Uh, and of course now knight c6 is very, very strong. Uh, the bishop comes out to h4, and again we see black just going for some kind of last minute desperate attacks on the king side. Of course it's not going to be enough here. And uh, the next three moves I think are very, very funny. So chat, what do you think? Knight takes b8, uh, should we play it? Should we not play it? What's the story here? What's the story here? Knight takes b8. Free rook, right? So I'm being a little bit mean. Of course, knight takes b8 is entirely winning. But when you see the game continuation, you would feel very, very foolish if you uh, had actually captured the, the rook on b8. The game continuation, Kramnik simply doubles on the d file, lets the rook hang. It's not like black is going to be much better if you spend a move playing uh, rook, rook b to a8. So rook c to d1, and we're actually making some threats here uh, against the bishop on h4. And so there's next two moves, of course, are rook b6, rook d4, and rook takes c6. So you saved yourself two tempi by, uh, by letting Svidler play rook b6, rook takes c6 for you, rather than playing knight takes b8. Uh, now we get bishop takes c6, and the game doesn't last much longer. Uh, Svidler takes on e5, we get bishop d7, rook d8, and rook takes h4. And it's not even worth counting the pieces. Uh, Svidler just had had enough at this point and threw in the towel. Uh, so another very impressive game by Kramnik. Again, the common thread here is activating this light squared bishop on this main diagonal uh, and just cruising through, crushing the opponents. Now, I think we have time to take a look at uh, sort of a miniature. It's not really a miniature, but Kramnik got a winning position straight out of the opening. And that is the third approach to the Catalan that I sort of want to talk about. So in this game, Kramnik is up against Arkady Nidich, and Nidich is just having none of this Catalan nonsense. Uh, he takes advantage of Kramnik's move order by playing an early c5 to prevent uh, you know, the, the classic Catalan setup. Now, uh, what's the problem with that? Well, after d4, uh, we get c takes d4. And so this is obviously something that would not be allowed in the more traditional Catalan setup. Uh, so what are we doing as Kramnik here? Well, Kramnik isn't flinching, simply bishop g2, same plan as always. We attack the light squares. Uh, Nidich plays e6, shoring up the center. We get castles by white, and Nidich now continues to blow things up in the middle and plays d takes c4. So this is pretty different than the mainline Catalans that we were looking at before. In this case, Nidich has opted for the most direct, the fastest play, just blowing up the center before white gets a chance to uh, do any of the funny setups um, that Catalan players know so well. So what do we do in this case? How do we take advantage of Nidich's play? Well, it's not going to be anything all that special. We're going to see Kramnik again quite simply attack the light squares, work to regain the pawns, and then we'll see uh, Nidich misses some pretty fun tactics uh, pretty early on here. So the d4 pawn is hanging. We should take it back. We get knight d5, and now Kramnik takes the time to play queen a4 check and capture the other pawn back on c4. So after knight 7 to b6, our queen's attacked, so queen to b3. Now bishop d7, and the question is, what has black's immediate play really done for him? And the answer is, not all that much. Uh, black's king is still stuck in the center, white has gotten castled, and it's not as if uh, this bishop is any less powerful than it would be in the normal Catalan. Uh, Knight is just trying to justify it by saying he got this nice blockade with these two knights on the d5 square uh, and is ready to play something like bishop c6 to neutralize the bishop. But of course, uh, Kramnik is just not going to give him that chance. Once again, we see this knight coming out to c3. And I really want to highlight this move because it's not just a normal developing move here. Of course, it does develop the piece, but this knight is critically important as an attacker on the d5 square. And after bishop takes or bishop c5, you're going to see this knight once again doing an early capture on the d5 square in order to soften up uh, black's position. So knight takes d5, knight takes d5, and now white to move and find a very, very strong continuation here. 
very strong. Very strong play here by Vladimir Kramnik. And yeah, apologies uh, again for um, however badly I am mispronouncing Nidich's name. I will never learn. Supriya gets kicked out of the class for suggesting bishop takes d5. Giving away the Catalan bishop? Are you insane? Of course we want to keep this bishop. Uh, and just kidding, Supriya, you can stay. But this bishop is our hopes and dreams. We don't want to get rid of it. But of course, the move knight f5, taking advantage of this idea of the bishop's pressure on the light squares. Knight f5 is just very, very strong here. And knight h, quite simply, is much worse. If you capture this knight, we're going to see queen takes d5. All pieces hanging for black, and white's going to go up uh, material pretty early on here. Um, so instead, we get castles. And what is the stellar follow-up that I'm sure you guys all saw when you played knight f5? What's the follow-up here? The knockout punch with the knight on f5. Uh, of course, you don't uh, get to stop calculating after e takes f5. You have to have some plan for if black ignores you and just castles. So what is that plan? Nick says bishop takes knight and queen c3, and that's going to be a, uh, an important part of the correct move, but not quite correct. You can do better. Of course, one problem with that line is that um, queen c3, the knight on f5 is hanging. So you get this bishop on c5, and you might be a little bit better, but it's not quite as good as you can do. Oisev says knight h6 check, even better than knight h6 check is knight takes on g7. And this move is the move that gives Kramnik the, the winning position here. So knight takes g7. If you take this guy, I'm going to take on d5. e takes d5, and now queen c3. And as before, we are uh, picking up the bishop on c5. We've just taken an extra g7 pawn along the way. And this is just way too strong. In the game, knight h plays knight f6. And Kramnik has a little bit of trouble uh, extricating this knight, but does manage to do it after all. We see him bring the queen over, uh, over here now to h4. Uh, knight h comes up with knight to g8. The idea is to remove the defender of the knight. And then we see Kramnik sort of bailing out with takes, takes, and takes, getting the rook for the two pieces. And after rook takes c6, um, white has one, two, three pawns and a rook for two pieces, which is plenty to go on to win the game. So really early opening kill by Kramnik here. And again, the common theme, as always, an assault on the light squares. Knight f5, the critical move. All right, and with that, we have only 10 minutes left, but I do want to go over the uh, game I sort of teased at the top of the hour. And that is Kramnik versus Topolov from their infamous match in 2006. For those of you unfamiliar, of course, Kramnik did go on to win this match, but it was not without controversy. Uh, there were some accusations of frequent bathroom trips. Of course, the computer, computer era was dawning in the chess world, uh, and there was a little bit of paranoia going on, I think. But, uh, and, and so in, in response, Kramnik forfeited game five, refused to play a move, but did end up to, to, uh, to go on to win the match anyways. So ignoring all that controversy, this was one of the games that they played in the match, and I wanted to walk you through it here. So Kramnik has white and plays d4, which should be no surprise to people familiar with the 2006 match. Of course, every game in the 2006 match started with d4, regardless of colors. Uh, Topolov played knight f6. We get c4, e6, knight f3, d5, and g3 entering the Catalan. And now we are finally going to take a look at the closed Catalan. So all of the previous positions we looked at were open or open Catalans, 
And now we're going to look at the closed Catalan. So what's the point of the closed Catalan? Well, we see black inserts this check. We get bishop d2, and then drops back to e7. And this is just a little bit of a subtlety that players have come up with over the years. The point now is that this bishop is actually in the way of the queen, in the way of the knight, and not really at all developed on d2. It's going to have to move again to get developed. And sometimes it would rather be on b2 than c3. So it misplaces the bishop. Um, and then black just continues on with normal development. Uh, we get bishop g2 now by white, castles, castles, and c6. So the point now for black is that we are not playing an early d take c4 because that seems ridiculous. You know, it opens this long diagonal for our opponent. So Topolov in this case choosing the other approach, just shoring up this pawn on d5 and trying to stunt this bishop uh, where it sits on g2. Now we get bishop f4 by white, highlighting that black's opening idea was maybe not so stupid. Um, just moving the bishop again. Now we get knight b to d7 by black, simple development. And queen c2 by white. Again, all normal developing moves that we've seen before. a5, rook d1. Again, this is a very nice square for the rook to support potential uh, d5 pushes. Now knight h5 attacks this bishop on, uh, on f4. And Kramnik is actually going to drop it all the way back to c1. Again, further justifying black's opening play. But uh, that doesn't mean it's a bad move. That just means that black had a, a, good, a good idea with bishop uh, b4 check. And now we see Topolov go for this idea of b5, trying to immediately clarify things in the center and on the queen side, forcing white to make a decision with the c4 pawn. Of course, white is not interested in playing something like c5. You don't want to lock things up over here. You want to rip open the light squares. So we get c takes d5 by Kramnik and c takes d5 by Topalov. Now, of course, uh, how should we continue here with white? How to continue with white? How to continue. Nick says knight c3, and we can actually be a little bit more direct than knight c3 in this case. Uh, and by the way, Topolov's opening play with pushing on the queen side has a couple nice added uh, bonuses for him, one of those being this move b4 can be rather annoying for white to deal with. So be on the lookout for that with this pawn sitting here on b5. So more active than knight c3. And yeah, the chat room is up to the task here with this move e4. Again, you just need to open up the light squares to play uh, play the Catalan. It's, that's the whole idea. Uh, of course, now, uh, black was not super interested in playing something like uh, bishop e7, let's say, because now we might actually see a little bit of a reversal here, because e5 can be very, very awkward to deal with with this knight sitting here on h5. Of course, there's an exception to every rule. And in this case, uh, black's pieces are awkwardly enough placed that white is willing to play something like e5, uh, lock down these light squares, and rear out the bishop somewhere else. So bishop e7, not really going to get the job done. What else could you try? Something like knight back to f6. Again, not going to be the greatest either. We'll simply take on d5. And uh, now, something like knight c3 would be a lot better, because we can respond to b4 with knight takes d5. And again, just keeping pressure up on the light squares. So instead of those options, we actually see uh, Topalov capture on e4, uh, drawing white's queen out, and perhaps trying to highlight the fact that this is not really the best orientation for white's pieces, when after rook b8, bishop b7 would come with tempo on the white queen. That's why we see Kramnik again rerouting the queen now back to e2 this time. We get knight back to f6. And now bishop, the bishop once again is going to move, this time out to f4, attacking this rook on b8. Rook b6. And now we can continue our attack on the light squares. So how to continue here? How to continue here? Topolov, so aggro. And yeah, that was his reputation. Uh, probably still is his reputation, if you ask me. Uh, Topolov, one of the most aggressive, one of the most combative tactical players 
of the past 20 years, I would say. So knight c3, again, would be a reasonable move. But don't forget, you do have to be on the lookout for these b4 ideas. You know, Black could even prepare them with something like bishop a6 and setting you up for some nasty tactics. And so yeah, Hassan has the right idea here with knight to e5. You want to open up this bishop and assault these light squares before Topalov is able to uh, counteract them with a bishop b7. Of course, bishop b7 in this case, not going to be good enough. We're going to take and knight c6. And at the very least, we can take this pawn on a5. We can also just develop, and this knight is very, very powerful once again. So instead, we see this move knight to d5. And compared to the previous game, Topalov has done much, much better in the opening of this game than our first three opponents. He's gotten this knight to d5. He hasn't really given up too much. He even has some extra space on the queen side. You know, his king's castled, all his pieces are developed, aside from this bishop here on b7. And it seems like for the moment, everything is defended. No clear path for Kramnik to break through. And so, what happens if we just play a simple move, like knight to c3? Well, then we're going to see knight 7 to f6. And all of a sudden, black is achieving a, a certain harmony in his position here. This knight covers this knight. The queen and the pawn have d5 well, well defended. Not really getting anywhere with knight takes d5. Um, and you know, bishop b7 is going to come out soon. Bishop uh, a6 could even come out. Black's going to expand on the queen side. Everything seems to make sense. Black has a plan. White hasn't broken through. What's the big idea? And so Kramnik in this position finds something immediate to do. So black to move here. How can we turn up the pressure uh, against Topalov? Okay, the chat's saying knight a3. I don't really get knight to a3. Um, I th guess you're, you're saying that if b4 gets played, I can um, hop to c4. I think, though, bishop a6 is a move black wants to play anyways. Uh, and black might, might be ever so tempted to, to even capture this knight and double your pawns. So not knight a3. Not quite knight a3. So as we're running a little bit short on time, I'm going to give you the move. It's bishop takes d5, the move that none of you should have considered giving away the Catalan bishop. Uh, so why does Kramnik give away the bishop? Well, in this case, it's going to come with a double attack against these pawns. And white is going to be able to go up a pawn here and use that as um, his proposed advantage. Now, Topalov does play well for the next few moves. Knight f6, take on b5, bishop a6, and a4. But it turns out an extra pawn is an extra pawn. And Topalov did go on to lose this game, with Kramnik having the big advantage with the white pieces. I'll, I'll scroll through it quickly. We got knight e4. Uh, Kramnik took over the c file once again. And then just a few retreating moves were the wrong idea for uh, Topalov here. And uh, pretty quickly, things just sort of fell apart with the powerful knight outposted on b5. Yes, it's pinned, but it also did turn out to be very, very powerful. Um, we saw this weird, funky trade with the pin being made use of. But Kramnik takes an extra pawn on d5. And before too long, uh, Kram or Topalov actually has to sacrifice this rook on b5 to get rid of the knight. And Kramnik pretty easily went on to win this endgame, trading queens. And it turns out rooks are more powerful than knights. And that was enough to win this game. So once again, I hope you guys enjoyed all of these Catalan games from Vladimir Kramnik. He popularized, popularized the opening in modern chess. And it's easy to see why. He makes it look very, very convincing and sometimes very, very easy to outplay these world-class players. He just ruthlessly goes after those light squares. And when it works, it works very, very well. Now, if you liked Kramnik playing the Catalan, you'll like Ulf Anderson playing the Catalan uh, even more. And hopefully, you'll like Grandmaster Denis Boros even more than me as well, as he is going to be the next lecturer on here. And he's also going to be talking about the Catalan uh, in honor of Ulf Anderson's birthday. So that's all I have for you tonight. As always, my name is Caleb Denby. I want to thank you guys very, very much for sticking this one out with me. 
Uh, and as always, I will see you next time.